thank you so much for joining me, Ms. Valerie Taylor, director Sally Aitken, and producer Bettina Dalton, while we chat about Valerie's life and work with their documentary, Playing with Sharks. Sally Aitken is an Emmy-nominated director and writer and showrunner of multiple international mm -hmm. series. Her award-winning work includes the Camera Door-nominated feature documentary, A Cinematic Life, selected for the Cannes Film Festival, and the David Stratton's Story of Australian Cinema, episode she wrote and directed, nominated for an international Emmy. Bettina Dalton is an Australian documentary producer and director, celebrated as one of the central women who have and continue to shape the face of natural history filmmaking in Australia. And Valerie, well, you've just seen her amazing life story in action and in conservation. So welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to be here. First, <laughs> Thank you so much. First, I'd like to ask Sally and Bettina, what drew you to Valerie and her story initially? And how would you describe this film? Um, well, starting chronologically, <laughs> as a child, um, you know, seeing Valerie on the front cover of the National Geographic magazine in the chainmail suit with a shark hanging off her arm really, you know, galvanized my thinking. I, I, she was the Marvel hero that, you know, I aspired to be. And I was fortunate enough to meet her when um, about 25 years ago and was asked to direct a three part series on her life. And that's when I got to know Ron and Valerie. No one loved them, fell in love with their archive, and we made that series. And then not so long ago, I was sitting in the cinema watching the Jane Goodall documentary. And I just had a moment of like, hold on a second, you know, we've got our own Jane living here just up the road, who is extraordinary and has not been honored for her incredible achievements. And she has this rich film archive that's beautifully preserved and could be remastered. And, um, you know, it was a very rich archive driven film and Sally has an extraordinary reputation for being able to weave really compelling narratives. So that's when I asked Sally to direct and Valerie and I and the three of us, kind of like the Charlie's Angels, we got on board and off we went. <laughs> and I'll let <laughs> Sally describe the film, but you know, obviously it's a, it's a really, it's honoring Valerie's life and legacy. It's, it's really show, showcasing our natural world across that shifting baselines. Like how often do you get to see 70 years of film footage of our oceans. Um, so Sally, you can describe more about um, in the film. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a hard film to describe in some ways because it's very simple. It's a life story, but it's, you know, so much more than that. I think probably the difference is that it's a way of seeing you know, seeing this massive shift in our oceans, but really through the personal experiences of someone who has lived and breathed and dived all over the world. I think it's a story that uh, is entirely empowering, obviously for women and for young girls, but actually for anybody, because Valerie is uh, someone sitting right beside me, who, uh, you know, has lived her life with such passion. And that is just infectious. And it's incredible. You know, we, we are literally, this is as close as we can get to, to a dive right now. She's itching to go. And uh, we've, seen, we've seen natural history films, but we are in an age, I think, where we're really understanding the personal connection with the natural world. So in summary, it's a story of an accidental conservationist who has, uh, you know, a life that sheds light on how we can all do our part for the planet. That's great. And Valerie, what was your reaction when Bettina and Sally approached you to make this docco? I'm not sure I had any big reaction. <laughs> I've been in the uh, documentary film industry for the most of my life. And I thought, oh, goody, another doco. I didn't quite expect it at this late stage in my life. And it was a bit sad that my husband had died because without his footage, 
there would have been no documentary, not, not like it is anyway. And his filming for so many decades has given Sally and Bettina the storyline to do this without having to go to a lot of trouble and look up old data and carry on like that. And I was very pleased to do it. Uh, there is a story to be told. I didn't realise how important it could be until it started to happen. And then I realised that because my husband and I started so long ago recording the marine world, long before it was fashionable, we have, we have recorded a history, not of the whole world underwater, but of Australian underwater and the local reefs and islands offshore, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, those places, which are marvellous. And everything we did to, back then, all those years ago, is now history. You can't make this film, you can't get this footage anymore. The human race, and their greed and apathy have changed the marine world forever. They've changed the life in the marine world and it hasn't been a good thing. It's a sad thing. So not only is this film about my life, it's also in a way about the life of the ocean. And, and isn't it amazing that we as human beings see ourselves as being outside of nature, not part of it. And I, I, you know, I just can't understand why that is in the Western world anyway, for the most part. Actually, so, Joni, that's a really good point to raise because I think something that comes through in Valerie's life, that very early on, she made a connection, not just with species, but with individual sharks and not just sharks. I mean, we featured sharks in the film, but the wonderful sequences you don't see, uh, Valerie having a 10, 15 year relationship with a moray eel that she will visit every year that comes out of its lair and wraps around her and Valerie interacting with octopus and you know these creatures in a way that she didn't allow that barrier that you speak of to be there she reached out she experienced and you know she really had a connection and she was able to read the language and behavior of these animals and and trust that interaction and i think as you point out for a long time we've been disconnected and i think now through everything we've been through you know with the covert with our climate change pandemics and with bushfires in Australia, you know, I feel there's a real yearning for us to reconnect. We realise that we can't live a life in a parallel lane with wildlife and our oceans and our natural world. We have to be connected because the two cannot survive unless we, we meet and compromise and care and nurture for each other. Yes, exactly. And for some reason, we think we can make it without nature and it's, it's crazy. And it, it, this it certainly isn't your typical conservation film. Do you hope to reach more people by approaching them in this more um, adventurous way and, and personal too? I, I think just from the reaction uh, to the film, that's been so powerful, but also the way that Valerie has motivated, you know, I, I describe Valerie as like the tip of a pyramid. You know, she's up here. She inspired me 50 years ago, dare I say it, um, you know, and she's inspired people with every generation. So all those people she's inspired are now scuba divers. Like, you know, I couldn't wait to learn to scuba dive because of Valerie. And I know that I'm just one of thousands of people who've been drawn to the ocean. You know, she taught my daughter to dive. She's now inspiring Sally's daughter. You know, so I think that personal story is has far greater impact as a motivator when you witness someone living, you know, taking action. And Valerie is an action figure. <laughs> um, so, you know, taking action, not waiting for things to happen, not waiting for the government to change laws, but knocking on doors, writing letters, saying, you know, these marine reserves need to be, you know, preserved and, and this great white shark habitat needs to be preserved. Like Valerie was always out there, you know, frontline making this happen. And I think that's a great 
motivator for us all, not just a didactic approach to a conservation story? I wouldn't have known how to do a didactic approach to a <laughs> conservation story, I think is also part of this answer. The truth is we like to be entertained and we like to be moved. And we do that through emotion in storytelling. And I think that Valerie's incredibly rich personal story mm -hmm. has so many layers to it. And I think people also really, really, really don't like to be told to eat muesli. You know, they they <laughs> want to engage. I think people <clears throat> want to be inspired. And so we were very actually aware that we were not, quote, making a conservation film. We were making a, 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 the, the most um, dramatic and um, uplifting and at times heart-wrenching story. And we had an incredibly magnetic central character who has perhaps the world's most idiosyncratic relationship <laughs> with the ocean's most charismatic predators. They were pretty good ingredients to start with and build build this uh, this great life trajectory through which we can see our own humanity. Yeah, well, I certainly found the film adventure packed, complete with James Bond <laughs> wetsuits, and with your feisty enthusiasm, give it a go, Valerie. <laughs> I take it that this has been your outlook and attitude to life from day one. Have I got that right? Um, yes, you definitely have. <laughs> you have that right. I've been very fortunate. I was a fortunate child. We were very poor, but my mother believed her children could do anything. And if a mother believes that, they believe they can too. So that's a good start. And I just left home or didn't actually leave home, left school when I turned 15. And I've said this before, I walked out the door, my mother said, you've got to go and get a job, you support yourself now. At 15, I walked out the door and the world was mine. I could do whatever I needed as long as I supported myself. And in a way, that's a gift. It's a gift from my mother and father. And I've pretty much done that all my life. Give it a go, Valerie. I just heard Sally say that. It's true. That was what my husband used to say all the time. Give it a go, Valerie. Jump off the boat into the sharks. You'll be right. I jumped off the boat into the feeding sharks and I was right. They all got a horrible fright and swam away. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's uh, been a, a fabulous life. I'm an incredibly lucky human being, especially being a woman, to go out into the world of men and beat them at their own game, and I did. The only one I couldn't beat was my husband because he was my teacher. <laughs> and I have seen a world that no longer exists. I worked in a world that no longer exists. I worked in the marine world before it was destroyed by hunters, fishermen. The problem with the marine world, it's free. You don't have to grow your cow. You don't have to plant a crop. You just harvest. And you don't have to pay anybody or do any work except to harvest. And that has been a sad part of the story. Not of my story the story of the planet, the story of over 60% of the planet has been denuded of life, mainly for the consumption of fish for human beings. And it's, it's sad, I'm fortunate. I saw it before this happened. I, I, this happened. I do often think of that because I live right by the, the sea in um, from the west coast of Canada. And I often think of that, just how it was, how it used to be, the, the incredible variety of sea life. And we just see such a tiny proportion of what it used to be. And just to see what I saw in your film, 
all of those sharks and all the sea life just it's absolutely amazing and here you are with us and to be able to talk about that and is tell people what it was like is so valuable because that means so much to show to talk but also to show like yeah. when you see the size of the fish you know in that early footage with the spear fishing you know you think wow when is the last time you saw a fish of that species of that size and it's a really interesting record because otherwise we don't know what we've lost and you know i think ron's footage um you know it's really important scientifically you know just a testament to our changing oceans and um you know it's rare as you say to have that that opportunity to showcase um that and we and we hope that that's a subliminal message i mean when you see people you, we had the experience of being in a real audience which was just tremendous um when people gasp you know when that that sack fish hits the ground and when they see all those fish just you know wantonly being harvested seemingly for no reason other than a competition people in the audience were were gasping you know and um so we we you know when that the sound of the fish landing i think landed very heavy in people's hearts as well in the audience absolutely yeah um valerie can you do you remember when you made that decision to stop spear hunting to stop killing and start caring for them instead absolutely i can even remember the time of day Ron and I had just been to the Australian Spearfishing Championships. He won the men's, I won the ladies. There was an offshore island with a beautiful reef covered in fish, all sorts of fish. It was out of a place in Queensland called Marichi Door. We had fished that island for spear guns. When we went there, it was loaded with good big fish. When we finished, it was denuded. We went back to shore and looked at all these fish, many of them very beautiful, all of them gentle, they, none of them meant us any harm, and we'd kill them for sport. And Ron said, I can't stand it, I'm not doing this anymore. And I said, I don't want to do it anymore either. And at the top of the game, we walked away and we never did it again. That's how we started. And we went into conservation, and I've done very well at it, partly because I know what we're doing. All those, that time I spent spearfishing, living on fishing boats, we couldn't afford to charter a boat for ourselves. We used to go out with the fishing boats, the fishermen, and pay our way in the afternoons we would spearfish, or Ron would spearfish, just to pay our way on the boat, to be able to get out there and shoot film. So it was a very telling time and I'm a little bit sad because there's not many people my age who started spearfishing or working in the ocean so long ago left to tell the story. Actually, I sometimes think I'm one of the only ones. I think that's true, you know. It is actually something we discussed that there would be really a handful of people who have been acutely observing the natural world and documenting it as long as Valerie. And I mean, Attenborough comes to mind. I think he first dived the Barrier Reef in the late 1950s, which was around the time that you were yes. um, starting to hit your stride as well. And being a witness to those decades of change, you are absolutely right. It's completely extraordinary. And we must listen. And it's 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 incredible that the archive was there to help um, tell that tale and uh, and to see how things once were. I mean, I remember when we discussed the Blue Water White Death film experience, uh, which is, you know, as you know, filmed in the Indian Ocean and with those 200 odd oceanic white tip sharks swirling around them another huge gasp from the live audience <laughs> the other day and maybe with some of these viewers too and the idea 
that not only can you not repeat that, but you actually can't even see those sharks anymore. It's just gobsmacking, you know, and distressing. And yeah, so so the record is there, but it's also there as a motivator, I think. Yes, when I went back to that area about three and a half years ago, not a single shark, nothing, empty water. And they are a deep ocean shark and they're very dangerous. They, they're big killers of people. They were, but they're gone. They've been filmed, thinned by the, basically the Chinese. And uh, I'm starting to wonder what the uh, deep water giant octopus and squid are feeding on now. Yeah. And that, when you think about all the sharks that are gone now, when, Think, just thinking about the the um, ecosystem there. Um, what was it that sharks provided the ecosystem in in general? They have to be ahead of the game. They are the garbage men of over two thirds of the world surface. We humans have no hope of doing as well as they do. They take out the sick, the old and unhealthy. They keep the species strong. And in every way of life, there has to be a top predator to start sorting out how everybody else lives. It's, you can see it exactly and perfectly, say in Africa, where there are herds of wild animals that breed like mad and they eat grass. And then there are very few big predators that eat the animals that eat grass. It's the same in the ocean. The great white shark doesn't have a lot of juveniles. It doesn't pup very often. And it's selective in what it eats. I know because we've worked with them for years and uh, it much prefers a piece of dead horse than a living piece of sea lion or anything. It's, they, they're very much into cleaning up what we don't need, what shouldn't be there. Yeah. And a wonderful example of how important the, the sharks are, that the last scene in the film in Fiji, Valerie had witnessed that reef as a completely dead reef with no sharks. And correct me if I'm wrong, Valerie, but when they started to, to entice the sharks back, the reef came back to life. And what was that in the space of two decades? Uh, yes, uh, within one decade, we could see it coming back. We, the corals were returning. And I, I know it sounds odd, but in a way it was shark shit. It's very full of protein and all the small things can eat it, including coral polyps. And uh, that was just the start. And the whole web of life began to reappear. I still go back there. It's wonderful. It's full of hope, at least, you know, when you see that that reef was dead and mm. that the sharks have come back. And when you see just that, I mean, okay, it's a slightly provisioning situation, but, you know, it's part of our changing world. Like if we didn't have the divers there and the tourists coming there, they could be they could be exposed or vulnerable to illegal fishing, which is kind of what's happened in the Galapagos. Like, even in Africa, having the presence of tourists actually limits the amount of poaching incursions that can occur in illegal fishing. So, we can play our part by not only contrib contributing, you know, our money towards the local economy, but giving a value to these species and supporting the local economy. So, you know, just that one shark dive has created a whole ecology in that village of Fiji, its own ecology with the people, with the tourists, with the sharks, and brought the leaf, the reef back to life. So there, you know, that, that scene, I always look at it with, you know, oh, there is hope. You know, that reef wasn't alive like it is today. And here's Valerie floating around and she saw it before when it was dying or dead and she's here and it's come back. So it's quite a hopeful scene, that one. Yeah. Um, do you know if they have, because parts of the Great Barrier Reef are, is really dying 
And do you, have they tried to do that in the Great Barrier Reef as well with sharks? Um, I don't think so. In 1967, my husband and I dove the Barrier Reef from one end to the other, filming on 35 millimeter all the way. Took us six months, two days to do it. Wow. And even then we saw reefs that were dying. But 20 years later on our own boat, we went back to those reefs and they were magnificent, alive and beautiful, just as nature intended. What had happened was we left them alone. We let nature handle the whole problem. And they, had, they were back. We humans think we're so wonderful. We can make it happen. We can not. Well, we can just leave it alone. Mm. Sadly, especially in Australia, there are all these young marine biologists who think they can go out and regrow the coral and do these things. Just let nature do it. Leave her alone. She'll do it. She'll handle it. And that probably gets to the sort of crucial point, which is these uh, tracts of land or parts of the ocean. Dr. Sylvia Earle calls them hope spots. And in a way, what you need are enough hope spots that they can start um, supporting each other. And so, yes, the idea of totally protecting an environment is, uh, well, to borrow Valerie's expression, bloody essential. Exactly. Well, and we see that, we see that on land too. It's like the places where we just leave alone, like let the wolves come back. What happens? Things are plentiful again. So Chernobyl, it, as an example. Yeah. You know? Yes. It's it's yes. just crazy what we think, you know, we can play God and and we can't. I mean, the earth and everything on it would be in a much better place if we just did take off <laughs> to somewhere else. Well. I don't think that's going to happen. No. And I do know people who play God. I have been put down more than once, quite a few times, because I don't have a university degree. I am not a true marine biologist. Experience is the greatest teacher. Not sitting in a class, listening to some person who's never been underwater in their life, telling you what it should be like and who should be there. Basically, they don't really know. I'm all for the old timers. There's one in America called Stanton Waterman. He's about the only one I know of my era who's left to tell the true stories. And Stan's pretty old now. He's a bit older than me. It's, it's a worry. I'm pleased about this documentary. It says a little bit. I don't know, maybe we can make another one telling the story, showing what it was like and what it was, what it's like now. We show that a little bit in the bull shark section, what it was like and what it's like now. They guaranteed in the days when we could be tourists and go there, seven species of shark on one dive in your face. Absolutely fantastic. And all those sharks, they had been trained enough, they'd been trained to come in at certain levels. The bull sharks were deep, went up to 35 feet. And there you've got the reef sharks, the, the gray reef sharks, the uh, tawny sharks, different species. Then you get up right into the shallows, one meter of water on top of the reef. And it's blue, black tip and white tip. And it's all there. And every now and then a tiger shark comes in or a hammerhead. But nowadays I've noticed the bull sharks are taking over because they're big, <laughs> angry guys, really. I like working with them because there's, it's the edge of a great excitement. Anything could happen and go wrong. Never has, but it's the possibility it makes it exciting. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> In documentary film, you almost never know what you're going to end up with in the end. Did you, did you all 
find you were making the same film that you were planning for in your initial development stage? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, when you were describing the bull sharks being on the edge of, mm -hmm. you know, potential danger, you could maybe be describing the filmmaking process there, Joni. <laughs> we, <laughs> look, I think, I think ultimately the film has resulted in how at least I imagined the film might be. You go on quite an adventure when you make a film because you're thinking about the different ingredients that are going to put it together. And, you know, in addition to having this enormous and beautiful archive to draw on, Valerie's kept a diary every, every year since 1969, handwritten, I might add. Wow. And um, very early on in the process, I remember reading them all also quite an extensive process but what what was really interesting about that experience was that 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 gave me an insight into Valerie then it's not a retrospective thing because she's writing the diaries at the time that these discoveries are happening and for a while we thought maybe we would incorporate the diaries into the eventual film but actually then we also realized that we are lucky enough to have the very vibrant amazing bold character herself so you know um it it became an iterative process we certainly kept uh, the um, editor, Adrian Rostriola, and I, um, who had worked together before, we kept revisiting the film archive to try and find new things in the film because so often that footage wasn't, wasn't shot for this purpose. It was shot for entirely other purposes. So we were looking around the edges, if you like. And then of course, um, thinking about the impact that the film might have and how to tell it in a st in a way that would be um, both true to the, if you like, native experience of an Australian uh, making her way in a global <laughs> environment, um, but without alienating American or, or British or European or Asian viewers to understand, you know, the universality of someone who wants to achieve in life and do it through adventure. Oh, well, as a, from the producer's point of view, I can say very happily that Sally delivered the film that I imagined beyond expectations. So like having known Valerie's footage and Ron's footage for many years and, you know, we even, the first shoot we ever did was the bull shark shoot. So it was the end of the film, but I think we always imagined that would be the end of the film. So, you know, I think, Sally just saw the key moments in the film, the key, you know, the, those moments of putting down the spears, the regret around Jaws. I think, you know, they were very strong, compelling drivers in the, in the film's narrative. And, you know, I think Sally and Adrian just delivered on that, you know, in spades and, and um, you know, beautifully drew in on the remastered footage. I mean, it was such a joy to be able to go back to that footage, the film, the celluloid, scan it all again and just see the richness and the texture of the film. I mean, Ron was a really meticulous person and a lot of people just let their film sit on the shelf. Uh, and he, he hand wrote logs and notes and had a little folder of all the years, including his wetsuit measurements as, as he, he, he kept, it, was, it was just wonderful. A little book, it was so different from Valerie's was an emotional diary. Ron's was a very technical diary. Uh, you know, when he was young, I won the 100 metre sprint or something. And then I, this year I run, won this. This is my wetsuit measurements. This is this roll of film, location, the boat they were on. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's fantastic first um, primary source, you know, to draw on. But the film was also beautifully kept and we're hoping that we can lodge it now with the National Film and Sound Archives because, you know, as a record of our reefs because we've remastered to 2K and 4K uh, digital, you know, so that, you know, that was a beauty. So the, the film was even more than a film, you know, it was, it was really an exercise in recording a history a record of our seas um, and Valerie's slides also like Valerie was an extraordinary stills photographer I mean Sally and I regretted there's this beautiful sequence in the film of you know Valerie as a National Geographic photographer and, and all those achievements we didn't even have time to 
touch on that. As, so Valerie's slide collection of 35 mil slides have now been um, given to the custodian of the National um, Maritime Museum. So, you know, the, these, these records, you know, are not going to be lost and they will be preserved and honored and, you know, metadata added and hopefully as a record for all to, to dip into. That is fantastic. That's amazing actually to have all that. Well done. <laughs> um, I just wanted to also ask, was there, um, were there treasured moments or maybe let's talk about surprising things. What, what, what was the most surprising thing that you learned or, or, or came across in making, making the film? Well, I just want to say the first thing was that Valerie can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That was definitely Tina and I looking at each other going, what? How can that even be possible? She gets, you get around pretty well though, don't you? <laughs> well, I don't have to be able to swim. I have to be able to die. There you go, there you go. I think, um, you know, one of the things, it's interesting, I was just um, reflecting on this as you were asking about, you know, was the film, the film that, you know, we had imagined. One of the difficulties, of course, is as a person, when you go, when you disappear, when you go on a journey um, of understanding, it can be very difficult to revisit those times when you didn't have that same knowledge. And it's to Valerie's great credit that the very distressing scenes, actually, of her in full lethal hunting power were able to be incorporated. And I can absolutely say categorically, that was really difficult for Valerie. And she really, really was not that keen on showing it because it is distressing, but equally understanding how important it is to see that trajectory. I think for me, the most surprising and actually hilarious moment was when she announced quite matter-of-factly that, you know, if you want to do a trick with a shark, as if we all intend to do tricks with sharks, you can teach them. And not only is that delightful, you know, because you do learn how to train a shark should you want to, yes. and, um, and very simple. But it also, again, is illustrative of how we underestimate the sentient quality and intelligence of other animals. And to do it in that kind of very whimsical, uh, anecdotal fashion. So that was definitely a surprise. And then I think in a strange way, and this is just me personally, I'm sure Tina has other um, views and maybe Valerie has um, different um, views as well. We talked about the fish flopping out in those um, spearfishing contests and of course they are a record of the enormity of the size of the reef fish that you could see up and down the coast but they are also a document of how we used to feel about that kind of um, conquest and acquisition and I can speak very personally in my family I grew up in New Zealand but we have photographs in our family archive of the fish strung up on the beach of just casual fishing, you know, the fishing that you would do out the, we call it a batch, but it's a holiday home. Uh, and ditto my husband, who's a West Coast Canadian, I might add, and the fish uh, that he and his family would catch. And the, and you know, and you said quite casually, oh, it's just not like that anymore. And suddenly to be confronted by the idea that you were complicit in those own family records of the destruction. And I might add, of course, you know, recreational fishing is nothing compared to commercial fishing. But suddenly that shock realization of my own culpability was for me profoundly moving. Wow, wow. And what about you, Valerie? Did, was, were there any surprising moments for you? In my life or in the film? Making the film. Uh, not really, no. because it was already there. Yeah. The only part we actually redid was the bull shark story. 
And uh, that, I was very pleased about that because I hadn't seen the bulls for about a year. And I went back to see them and I met people that I was fond of and uh, I hope to get back as soon as we're allowed to have another visit. But it's, uh, I, I just don't know how to actually explain it. It was just a life. I went through a life that nobody else was going through. I'm a painter. I couldn't be a painter. It was yeah. lovely for Valerie to have her nephew filming also underwater in Fiji. So the sort of legacy of passing on. Um, and I think you brought over some of Ron's old housings. You know, yeah. we, yes. you know, so there was a lovely, like Ron was with us on that trip, I felt very much, because it was the last place that Ron and Valerie dived together. So there was a lot of emotion and, and the local people, we had a carver ceremony for Valerie and she was like a queen. She was placed on this pedestal and they sang and that didn't make it into the film, but it was it was about Valerie coming back and they knew that she had had this, she and Ron had had this long history of bringing their reef back to life. And, um, you know, it's such a part of the village. So, you know, the, the making of that sequence, we didn't, fortunately we did it first because we wouldn't have been able to go back. like. That was the vet, like I think Sally had just come off another job and it was like she had like four days and bang we're on the plane um but thankfully we did that because um you know we we wouldn't have been able to go back but I I, I think being that was a good start to the film because it was a real motivator it was really positive and Valerie got to be with her her friends the little Finn friends and they all came to greet her with a little flick of the tail and you know it's like it's kind of like the yes. star version yeah, of a high face. five Valerie you know here she is you know and 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 beware if you didn't catch that on camera because yes. you know <laughs> you thing Valerie said when she came out she took a rag out and she said did you get it like <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely amazing what what a life valerie and you're just oh my gosh so lucky to have seen those seas and oceans when you saw them oh well, i'm the luckiest female i know i've had the best life of anyone i know and i mean i'm halfway through my 80s right now and i don't know how much longer i'll be able to dive and travel Probably not at all if this virus doesn't go away. And uh, I'm, I'm just happy to see the film and to see that a little bit of what I've done in my life is recorded because there is so much not in there, so very much. And uh, at first I was all disappointed and wanted this in there and that in there, but I now realise that the editor chose what he did to make a certain type of story. Something I'd like to add is that you can train a shark. You have to do it with food and you must not feel afraid. You've got to be very calm, very sweet and offer it food. And you might have seen me on the fin of a small shark about 10 feet. That was a nursey. She was one of my very few shark friends, only for a few days but I did it with food. And Nursie, I just hang on to her and we'd go around the reef together and she was a special shark. And the other bit I hung on to, anybody can do that, that was a grail shark. And uh, you get criticized for doing it, but the general public don't understand. It's like going up and stroking a tiger. Hello, how are you? You're a nice tiger. It's just like that, same thing. <laughs> uh, one day maybe, Everybody will go out and do that sort of thing, but those fish and those sharks may not be there. That's going to happen. I can see it happening. It's happening right now as I speak. Exactly. And I can only hope that each one of us, everybody out there gets a chance to have a special shark and to be able to teach, teach it a trick. That's what we can only hope that that will continue. Yeah. You can teach it a trick, but you have to feed it and, and actually feed it with your hand. And right. probably register if the shark wants to be uh, playing along, right? I think about food. They all want to be playing along, I believe. It. <laughs> and, and we have to first find a shark, which is a bit harder these days, but 
Let's hope that that will get easier again. And for those who can't get out, that all those bull sharks in Fiji, you can adopt them. Oh. And so we've adopted, well, I've adopted one whose name happens to be Valerie May. I don't know why I thought of that name, but um, so <laughs> each one of those sharks are named and new sharks come in and they actually breed in the rivers of Fiji. So part of the place where we filmed has an adopt a shark program. So for anyone, you know, they can just Google that and, um, you know, adopt a shark and, and, you know, it's wonderful to go there and there's, a, you know, a video record of all the sharks and their behavior and when they're pregnant and when they disappear and when they come back. So there's a sense of being involved in their lives, even if you don't get to go to Fiji. Oh, that's terrific. Hopefully we'll all do that. Thank you, Valerie, Sally, Bettina for being here with us in our, as I like to call them, our we ocean aquarium windows. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, thank yes. You. Thank you. And thanks to all the audience for, you know, watching the film and, you know, uh, just being a part of it. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's very exciting for us to feel part of the rest of the world, even though we're stuck here. <laughs> it's been, just been wonderful sharing your thoughts and your personal experience and shared experiences too in creating this just this wonderful adventurous conservation film thank you thanks Joni. and thank you all out there in cyberspace for joining us and to all our sponsors and donors i'm extremely grateful to you all for helping us keep Docklands alive and kicking through this very challenging year Please do take in as many of the films and events on offer until May 16th. We owe so much to documentary filmmakers. They add so much to our lives. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.